Hello and welcome to Current Affairs on JTV. Today we're having a discussion on what are the impediments to the peace process between uh, Palestinians and Israelis. And joining me in the studio is distinguished human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell and on the line from Israel, Itamar Marcus, who is the founder of Palestinian Media Watch. Gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, joining me today. Um, I think the first question for both of you is, and I'll start with you, Peter, as you're sitting here with me. Um, what are the impediments, do you think, to peace between the Israelis and Palestinians? If you could sketch them out for us. Well, I think there are many impediments, but the core one is the issue of the occupation, the way in which over the last seven decades, progressively, the boundaries of the State of Israel have expanded and new settlements have also expanded, uh, particularly, of course, the 500,000 plus um, new uh, settlers on the West Bank and in East Jerusalem. From the Palestinian perspective, they feel squeezed out of land where their families and forebears traditionally lived. And we are seeing this on an ongoing scale. It isn't as if it ended in 1948 or 1967 or even 10 years ago. We are seeing a constant process of new uh, settlers moving in to the West Bank and East Jerusalem paralleled by uh, the forcing out of Arabs from, for example, the Negev Desert. So, 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 the, so the issue really is about this fundamental injustice that Palestinian people have been forced off land that they had traditionally occupied. And that's your number one issue, you feel? Absolutely. Well, it's not my issue, it's the Palestinian issue. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the issue that time and time again they will uh, mention. There are subsidiary issues such as the discrimination against Arab people living in Israel, which of course the Oil Commission exposed uh, a decade or so ago. Okay, let's come back to those, but I'm going to take your main contention. Itamar, um, you've obviously heard what Peter has said there. Do you think he's correct? Is it the occupation stroke settlements that is responsible for the lack of peace between the two peoples? Uh, I'll start off with uh, Peter's last line where he said, this is not my opinion, this is the Palestinian opinion, and I will say just the opposite. That is Peter's opinion, but it's not the Palestinian opinion. The Palestinian authority to its own people in Arabic is teaching a very, very different message. We have seen numerous times in recent years on children's programs where children are taught that the conflict is because Jews are descendants of monkeys and pigs. Jews are Satan. Uh, Jews are the enemies of Allah. Uh, this is a repeated theme. There's one, uh, there's one poem which we've heard six times in the last few years that has the words, our enemy Zion is Satan with a tail. Now, the problem with this messaging that we're hearing for children is that we're hearing it ideologically expressed at the, at the senior level of the Palestinian Authority. And I'll give you one very, very important example. Uh, Mahmoud al-Habash is probably the most important religious leader in the Palestinian Authority. He was appointed by Mahmoud Abbas, uh, the Palestinian Authority chairman, to be head of the Sharia courts and his personal advisor on Islam. Now, uh, a number of months ago, he spoke on Palestinian Authority television, and he said the following. He said that the conflict uh, in Palestine is the historic conflict against the Jews, Islam against the Jews. He defined it as a conflict against evil, against falsehood, and the evil and the falsehood is connected to Satan and the devil. And he then said, there's nothing new in our conflict here. This is Allah's, uh, this is Allah's project versus Satan's project. What is the message coming from the Palestinian Authority? The problem is not territory. The problem is not occupation. The problem is not settlement. The problem is that the Jews inherently are the enemy of Allah. Uh, the settlements are a representation of, I'm sorry, Israel. Israel is a representation of Satan in the world. Now, when Palestinians are brought up on this messaging, uh, any adjustments that will be done in territory will have absolutely no effect. And look at Gaza as the proof. We left Gaza and Israel has gotten war and destruction. Thousands of Palestinians and Israelis were killed because of it. Until the messaging, until the ideology of the Palestinian Authority accepts Jews as human beings, as equals, who have a right to their own state in the Middle East, until that message comes to the Palestinian people, there is really nothing to talk about with the Palestinian leadership. When all they're talking to their people now is how can we most easily get Israel into a weak position. That's the message to their people. 
Okay. Well, I hear that, and I unreservedly condemn that demonization in those books and the messages that have come out from some, some Palestinian leaders. But I think you have made a fundamental error which echoes the fundamental error of the Israeli state. You are talking about what the leaders are saying and doing in the Palestinian Authority and in Gaza. What Israel needs to do is to speak to the Palestinian people, to circumvent the leadership with a message of hope, optimism, resolution and justice. And if you message the Palestinian people with that message, you will undermine the hardliners that are rejectionists. It may take time, but it will happen. And I think the fact, the fact is that we know that, unfortunately, just as Israeli public opinion is hardened towards a rejectionist position, so has Palestinian opinion. But we also know there is a substantial Stay minority here in Palestine who do want to live in harmony and equality with Jewish people. And those are the people you need to speak to and the others who potentially can ultimately be won over. Okay, so there are a couple of things here. First of all, the problem is that the, the, the leadership of the Palestinian Authority is giving these messages to its own people and especially to its children. And with their messaging, with their messaging, we're seeing uh, that in polls, Palestinian Authority is adopting these messages. And I'll just give you one uh, a tragic example of this. Uh, Palestinians were asked a few years ago if they recognize Israel's right to exist. So the older Palestinians, age 50 and above, 50% recognized Israel's right to exist. The younger Palestinians who have been exposed to this education from the youngest age and exposed to the message that Israel has, uh, only 8% recognized Israel's right to exist. 92% said Israel has no right to exist. And even worse, when Palestinians were asked recently in a poll by the Washington Institute, uh, what would be the game plan if the Palestinians reached peace with Israel uh, and they got all of their demands answered, West Bank, refugees, everything was resolved. Should they then continue to try to liberate historic Palestine? 65% of Palestinians said yes. And when asked, what do you think the government policy is? 67% said yes. So you have an overwhelming two thirds of Palestinians believe that their government's plan is to weaken Israel by getting some kind of a peace deal with them where Israel will then be in indefensible borders and then, and then to continue until until Israel is destroyed. So it's wishful thinking, and I wish there were a Palestinian. But I want to say just add one more thing. You mentioned direct contact between Palestinians. This is something that we at Palestinian Media Watch have been promoting for the very, very longest time. Uh, and I'll give you an example of how we promote this. The Palestinian Authority is afraid of direct contact between Palestinians and Israelis. They call it normalization and they prohibit normalization. And I want to give you an example of how effective normalization can be and how successful but, the yeah, I, think, I think we should and try how Palestinians and... respond. I just want to give you this one example. Right after the Gaza war, the Paris Center for Peace sponsored a uh, football tournament for Palestinian and Israeli youth, the end of which it was reported by France Press was an overwhelming success. Israeli children expressed how good it was to be back and play together after the war. And a Palestinian 11 year old named Kusai was interviewed and said, uh, I love we can play to, I, I wish we could have peace between Arabs and Jews so that we could play together like this. So it was an overwhelming success. Now, the Palestinian Authority Olympic Committee immediately condemned this and called for the people to be put on trial who participated. And Jabril Rajoub, who's head of the Palestinian Olympic Committee and head of their sports authority and head of the Palestinian Authority scout, what did he say? Any normalization with the Zionist enemy is a crime against humanity. So we want and we try to encourage contact between Palestinians and Israelis to build real peace. And the Palestinian Authority tells their people building real peace with Israelis is a crime against humanity. This is what we are up against. OK, well, I, I hear what you're saying and I condemn much of that. But you are just reinforcing, with all due respect, the rejectionism on both sides. Because both sides have substantial proportions of their population who adopt a hardline rejectionist position. Of course, we have to acknowledge that. But if we simply say that means there can be no progress, 
of course there will be no progress. What we have to do is move beyond the lager mentality that afflicts large sections of Israeli society and large sections of Palestinian society. We have to look at ways, how can we break this logjam? Simply saying the Palestinian leadership is awful and they're doing all these terrible things, or saying the Israeli leadership is awful and they're doing these terrible things, that won't progress us anywhere. Well, let me, let me we, need, we need to come up with a game changer, well, what is the game a changer? new initiative. Peter, what is the game changer then? Because well, we, we'll come uh, on to this, but what is, what, is that, what is that game changer? Well, if I didn't know better, I would believe, or be tempted to believe, that successive Israeli leaders are secret Hamas agents. Because the way they respond to the Palestinians reinforces time and time again the hardline rejectionists. It doesn't pull the rug out from under them, it just reinforces their rejectionist position. It plays into their hands. Now if I was an Israeli leader, I'm not, and many people may say, thank heavens, not, but if I was an Israeli leader, I would say that as the strongest of the two parties, as the party which has over the decades taken more and more land and dispossessed more Palestinian people, it is our duty to be the initiator of some grand gesture that can undermine the rejectionist on the Palestinian side. So I would, for example, say that unilaterally, as an Israeli Prime Minister, I would announce that there would be a full withdrawal from East Jerusalem and the West Bank by all Jewish settlers. And that there would be a, a fund set up by Israel to help fund, build new housing, hospitals and schools for Palestinian people. Now that, that is a very risky strategy, I agree. But it would be a, an absolute, create an absolute global shockwave because this would be unprecedented, unexpected, and turn everything that Israel has previously done on its head. It would mostly, and very significantly, put the Palestinian rejectionists, the hardliners, on the back foot. It would pull out from under them the rationale for their hardline rejectionist position. It's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Now, first of all, um, it, 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 that gesture would in all likelihood bring about the deaths of hundreds, if not thousands, of Israelis. Uh, the leaving of the West Bank, putting the airport, for example, within just a couple of kilometers of any homemade missile. What, do you think any country in the world is going to fly to Israel after the first missile volley, uh, volley of missiles land on the, uh, on the international airport? And they could even be homemade missiles that no one would be able to stop. Second, Hamas would take over. Do you know that every night Israel is in the West Bank arresting Hamas operatives? And why is Abbas allowing this? Because he knows that Hamas would take over in the West Bank, just like they did in Gaza, if not for Israel's protection. So Israel is protecting Hamas. You're suggesting that Israel go to those borders, uh, which are really indefensible, and from those borders, Hamas would have the potential literally to keep it, to put Israel under siege. Like I said, the first rockets that would land on the airport, that would be the end of international visits and international trade to Israel. Uh, now, I want to tell you one more thing. The Palestinian leadership knows that these borders are indefensible. And I want to tell you what Abbas Zaki said. Abbas Zaki is a member of the Fatah Central Committee, and Abbas himself sometimes sends him to make speeches in his name as, as his personal emissary. He's a very senior person, Abbas Zaki. He said on television, the following, we tell the world, we say that we want the June 67 borders. Why? Because everyone knows that Israel can't survive those borders. Our goal is all of Palestine. And then he says, you can say it to yourself, you can't say it to the world. And of course, we were listening and we have this documented. Uh, so that a senior person close to Mahmoud Abbas is telling everyone, Israel can't survive those borders. And you're saying Israel should unilaterally make that gesture when we know from polls that 65% of Palestinians from that position will want to continue fighting to destroy Israel. Uh, Israel can do gestures to the Palestinians to promote peace. Now, I want to give you my answer. What do I think will promote peace? And this is something that we've suggested to donor countries around the world. 
Uh, the international community funds about a third of the Palestinian Authority budget. Uh, that budget today is going to pay the salaries of terrorists in prison, the salaries of families of suicide bombers. Uh, it's it's horrific with them, and not to mention to pay the salaries of people like Mahmoud al who I just mentioned, who says Israel is Satan's project. What did I recommend, and what have we recommended to some of these members of parliament? That 10% of the money that they give to the Palestinian Authority will go to building normalization activities. In other words, the Palestinian Authority, if they want to get 50 million euro from the European country, 10%, 5 million euro has to go to real peace building activities. Meaning what? Israel and the PA would have to build on their borders uh, stadiums, places for cultural events, theaters, and then Israelis and Palestinians would have to participate together. This would bypass the hatred of the leadership. It would create normal relationships between people. And just like that 11-year-old Kusai, just from one afternoon, learned that he wanted peace with Israel, this could really, really build peace in the long term. So the answer is, we have to build peace from the bottom up. The international community must impose, with its financial leverage, must impose on the Palestinian Authority normalization contacts between Israelis and Palestinians. Enough, imagine, imagine where we'll be in, in five years if every single Palestinian high school kid uh, spent at least one day a year playing with Israeli children, either in culture, in the theater, or in a sporting event. It would be amazing. It'll be a different population. You won't have... But Isamar, that uh, cuts. Isamar, that works both ways, right? That's going to be every single Israeli child playing with a exactly, Palestinian. Exactly, exactly. They'll know each other and they'll care. This is the way. We can't have unilateral suicide gestures that are just going to bring death and destruction. What we need is real peace. Once we have this real peace building at the people level, then we can sit down with people who really want peace. And at that point, I don't think there would be a problem uh, readjusting the borders. But that can only happen once we have people who really want to have peace with Israel. I'm all in favor and support bridge building and people to people contact. You're absolutely right. That is a very important ingredient in the mix towards a resolution and a de-escalation. But I don't think it's going to be enough while there is this question of all these settlers in the West Bank and increasingly in East Jerusalem. The Palestinian perception is that they are being colonized in their own territories and lands. That's their perception. You may disagree with it, but that is their perception and that is the, increasingly the way most of the world sees it. When you think about it, since 1948, the Israeli state has built over 700 new Jewish communities. When I last checked, it hadn't built a single new Arab community. And in fact, many of the Arab villages that exist are not even on the Israeli maps. They've got no facilities like electricity and water. Those core injustices are what is driving the mass of public opinion as opposed to leadership opinion in Palestine. And if you start to change those fundamentals, I believe public opinion will begin to change as well. But it just means you can't just do the nice, laudable people-to-people -people contact. Let me, let me just break in there for one second before Ismail comes in. Ismail mentioned it earlier. There is, of course, the example of the Gaza withdrawal. That was just what you've been saying. It was a unilateral gesture by somebody nobody thought would do such a thing, pulling everyone out of Gaza. Settlers uprooted, out, leave everything, off you go. So, you know, soldiers carting away settlers refusing to leave even. And yet the reaction wasn't better peace relations. Well, first of all, Gaza was a partial, and in Palestinian terms, a half-hearted, incomplete gesture. Um, but you don't also, know what that would have led to. You don't know also, also, of course, Gaza was not free because it was basically an imprisoned section of Palestinian land around which or through which there was no free movement. There was an effective siege around Gaza. Well, not, so, not in 2005 there wasn't. Oh, yes, there was. No, not in 2005. There was no free movement. Well, free movement All kinds there. of restrictions. Yeah, well, the restriction, there were, but it yeah. wasn't not a siege, Peter. I think there's two different terms. For, uh, well, I don't mean a, a military siege, right. but there, there, was, there was not... Gaza was not a free and independent entity as most people would imagine that a free and independent no, ent there entity were is. There were, there were border restrictions like any two countries would have in that sense. Of course there were border yeah, but, restrictions. But, and, and with the Egyptians, yeah, let's not forget yeah, as well. Yeah, well, exactly with the Egyptians as well. Um, but that meant 
that the Palestinian perception was that this was, well, I think, I think it were, they, they were wrong to be totally rejectionist of it, but I, the perception was that it was a deal that was still hedged with far too many restrictions and wasn't a genuine you know, independence um, and autonomy for them. Okay, if I, if I can step in here, Alan. Um, the, the, the problem with, with what you're saying uh, are two. First, on the fundamental level, uh, the West Bank, uh, working with an assumption that the West Bank is Palestinian territory, you know, historically, I'm sure you know, is not true. The West Bank had been illegally occupied by Jordan. Uh, Israel got the West Bank in a defensive war. Uh, and according to uh, legal opinions, Israel has as much right to it as the Palestinian Authority. There is no settlement on Palestinian land. It was settlement that was on state land. Uh, and I think you know this. Right now, Palestinians claim it. Israel claims it, and they should be discussing this as a territorial issue. And if it's discussed as a territorial issue, there can be a just, uh, a just realigning of the borders. So that's the first principle. Well, can I just the pick up, thing, I pick up on that? On that, on that point. On that point. Is, Isamar, just let let, Isamar, just let Peter, let just Peter is, come in on that. I Isamar, wish, let him. <laughs> I wish the Palestinians would say to their people, like you're saying, that the problem is settlements, but they don't. The the main theme that we hear from them is a denial of the Jewish humanity, the denial of Israel to exist on any borders. You know, there's a children's program, which is a, it's on twice a week. It's called Beit Biyut, uh, the best home. And they had this beautiful puppet on the other day. Uh, and this is actually rebroadcast three times. And the puppet is talking to the children. And it says in the background, look, here's a picture of Jaffa. Uh, the Israelis took it and became Tel Aviv, but it's Jaffa. And then the moderator says to the children in the studio audience and on TV, yes, Jaffa was occupied in 1948, and Jaffa will turn to us. But not only Jaffa, but Haifa and Akko and, 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 uh, and another city. All of this will return to Palestine someday. And it's a constant message. So the child is brought up in the Palestinian Authority believing that all of Israel is a settlement, all of Israel is an occupation, and that's the word they use in their media all the time. All of Israel is an occupation. Well, when children are brought up with a, why would we believe? Because Israel all of a sudden goes back to uh, the 67 borders, all of a sudden Palestinians are going to reject everything they've heard from their Fatah leaders since since we've been following, no, they wouldn't. So I take to you again, I wish they would say settlements was the problem because then we'd have something to talk about. When they say Tel Aviv is the problem, Haifa is the problem, the Jews are monkeys and pigs is the problem, then right now we have nothing to talk about until we build those bridges with the people. I hear what you say, but I don't think it's going to bring any resolution. I'm sure you want a resolution, but I don't think it's going to bring it because I don't think what you're proposing is sufficient to actually move the goalposts, to fundamentally change the scenario, the terrain. Um, if people start talking, let, let, let the goalposts will move. Yeah. If I mean, people start well, talking. Uh, the issue of the settlements, it wouldn't be so bad if the settlements had been fixed for the last 20, 30 or 40 years, but they're constantly being expanded. That's like rubbing salt into the wounds of the Palestinians. They see the Israelis saying, let's talk. But on the other hand, what they actually do is expand the settlements. The other point I'd say is that, frankly, the tit for tat is not working. It's not getting a result. Moreover, an eye for an eye leaves us all blind. Okay, I, the, the issue of settlements has been proven over and over again not to be the issue that prevents Palestinians from talking. Uh, it's really used as a smokescreen by the Palestinian Authority. And I'll just give you an example. Um, a number of years ago, two years ago, was uh, Mahmoud Abbas and the PA said they wouldn't come to talks with Israel until Israel froze the settlements. Israel froze the settlements for a year, for nearly a year. Uh, Mahmoud Abbas came to the talks. He did not budge on one issue. He did not compromise. He barely even came to the talks. In fact, I think it took about nine months for him even to agree to the talks. And then in the last two, two months, of course, there was no chance to do anything. In other words, the Palestinian Authority is using the word settlements as an excuse. Second, 
as I told you, uh, not only do I feel that settlements are, are morally and ethically right, the Oslo Accords says that settlements are supposed to be saved for the final status negotiations. And yet the Palestinian Authority is refusing to come to those final status negotiations. They want to determine the end of negotiations before they even come to them. Uh, they, there are Jewish settlements that are on land where Jews have been living for over 100 years, like Gush Etzion outside of Jerusalem and other places. So these are issues that have to be discussed. You can't just come and say, give in 100% and then I will come and discuss. So both on the tactical level of settlements, it's a completely wrong, it's a smokescreen by the Palestinian Authority not to come. And the reason they use this smokescreen is, is very significant. It's because of decent people like you, good people like you who believe that that is the main reason, the main obstacle to peace. You then fight for them in the international court. You're, they think, they, they allow you and other countries to fight for them to get what they can't get through negotiations. And then they don't even have to come and negotiate. Uh, the main obstacle to peace right now is the Palestinian Authority messaging of hate, killing that they give to their people uh, and their unwillingness to even come and discuss anything seriously with Israel. Uh, and of course, what I mentioned before is the preventing normalization. Let's have normalization. Let's have people to be, you know what, if we had people to people contacts for five years, like I described to you, and children would come home and tell their parents that they met Israelis, uh, and parents would go to cultural events, you know what, they would tell Mahmoud Abbas, stop your hate preaching. Stop your hate preaching. We want a different situation. So we need the people online for peace before there's going to be any chance of political adjustments. Well, I think that's all we have time for today. Peter Isamar, thank you for uh, joining us today. I think perhaps unsurprisingly we failed to uh, reach a point of end agreement, although I did notice some encouraging signs about at least understanding the value of bilateral contacts along the way. And hopefully that may uh, yet give others some pause for thought. But thank you both uh, for joining me in the studio today and thank you uh, for joining us as well. We'll see you again soon for another episode of Current Affairs on JTV.